Destination I Do's podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Stein, and today we are exploring what it's like to work with a destination wedding planner and event designer. And we're going to cover some heavy hitting questions like how do they keep you on budget? And should you hire them before or after you've picked your venue? And then one of the biggest things, what's the biggest mistake that wedding planners think that you're making? So today I am joined by an absolutely stellar human being and also huge talent in our industry, Beth Helmstetter from Beth Helmstetter Events. It is a full service event design and production studio specializing in multi-day weddings and celebrations throughout the world. Beth has planned and designed events everywhere from Italy, Paris, Bali, Philippines, Costa Rica, Mexico, all over the United States. She is celebrated by multiple different media outlets as the one of the best wedding planners in the whole world. And I'm so excited to welcome you to the show. Thank you for coming, Beth. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, of course. So we're going to just dive right into it. Um, I would love to hear you just talk about how you got your start as a wedding planner and just how you transitioned into destination weddings. I feel like that's going to be really interesting. Yeah. So honestly, the biggest piece of my career started in destination weddings, but there was a couple of steps that got there. I was in the nonprofit world. I was making $27,000 a year. I could not pay my bills. Um, and one of our, our donors owned a property where they held weddings on the weekends. Um, my background is in nonprofit and business administration. But once I started supporting her on the weekends, I just fell in love. Um, and three months later, uh, basically when I fell in love, I started looking for wedding planning jobs, which really weren't a thing where I was from. Um, but three months later, I moved from Kansas City to Maui, where I became the wedding planner at a resort um, on the island of Maui. Uh, and it was all destination weddings it, it, different, in a way different capacity, a way different level of expectations than I do now. But mm -hmm. out of the gate, once I started serving clients fully from beginning to end, it was kind of this thought process of someone bringing their guests from far away, navigating kind of the concerns they might have when they can't touch and feel everything. So my, my, my true experience really started at Destination Weddings. And then once I left that job and I started building my own business, it just kind of snowballed where... You know, obviously I was a true expert in Hawaii, so I would do all the other islands. And then people started to be like, oh, could you, my cousin's getting married in Mexico, could you do that? Or we're looking at Aspen, what do you think about that? And so it really just snowballed from there. That's awesome. So how many, like roughly, do you know how many weddings, uh, just weddings, not events, but like weddings you've planned at this point? Ooh, um, with my company, probably about 150 over 15 years. Okay. Um, with, uh, if you include the work I did at that resort, I did 300 weddings in two and a half years. So almost 500 weddings oh at this point, it was very oh much a uh, wedding factory. I would do four weddings a week. It was, it was bananas. It was crazy. But wow. those, sometimes those weddings were like two people elopements and sometimes it was 200 people for four days. It, it was quite a variety there. So a lot, well, a I, lot of weddings. <laughs> I feel like what you said before, like what it started as you know, when you were at the resort and what those weddings look like versus what they're like now. And we've, you know, here at Destination I Do, we've seen that just with the submissions. I mean, yeah. we've been around 19 years and the very first submissions that we would get were like kind of the all-inclusive package where you got your cake, you got your flowers, you got your photography all at once. And that was, that was the level of personalization was your gown and the couple, yeah. that was it. Um, yep. and now it's like, you can't almost discern the level of details from a hometown wedding to a destination wedding anymore. It's like, there's just, they, yes. it's, it's everything, which is, I think really cool that couples are, are so creative and planners specifically are so creative. So I understand you design and plan. So when someone hires you, do they automatically get both? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so I, I have a nice, uh, I have a lovely team of associates. So we offer um, event production and and design. Um, we do both for every client. That's anyone who comes to us wants both. Um, I serve as kind of the creative director, and I focus obviously on the aesthetic design, but also guest experience design. Um, and also I have a lot of experience in travel. Um, and then I have a producer on my team who focuses a lot on the logistics, like, you know, budgets, timelines, floor plans, and so on. So the answer is yes, they get both when they work with me. Um, but it is, 
it is divided amongst uh, other associates on my team. And we have a nice support staff under, under uh, myself and my producer as well. That's awesome. So you plan a lot of like foreign events. So how yeah. do you handle like the logistics of coordinating with vendors and suppliers in different foreign locations? Like, do you have certain regions you specialize in? So you really know like the, the suppliers in that area, the vendors in that area, or can you plan a wedding like anywhere in the world? Yeah, we plan anywhere. I actually love to work um, somewhere I've never worked before. There are definitely regions we get called for over and over again, Mexico and Italy. I don't necessarily think that's because people see us as like the go-to in those regions is more of they're just more popular locations. Um, but we've, you know, we've definitely worked in lots of places that we've worked in Korea. We just got done working in the UK. Um, and I really love the variety. Uh, I approach it a couple of different ways. Number one, I really think our industry is much smaller than, than most people think. So I, I have a really strong network of, of people I know and trust, whether it's in the hospitality industry as a whole or other wedding, um, wedding professionals across the world where I'm really tapping their expertise. And depending on the location, I will hire what I consider to be a local specialist. So this is specifically important um, when I'm working somewhere where it's it's, there's going to be language barriers. For instance, I'm working in Turkey right now, Bodrum, Turkey. And so I have a, a woman on the ground to kind of help me navigate contracts if we need it. Um, if we're running into any blockages with some of the vendors, she's there and can kind of check on things. And so I approach it a couple of different ways. But places like, for instance, Italy, I've worked so many times, I, I actually don't need that support. I know who to hire. I know um, I know where to go. But if it's a new destination, I almost always hire someone locally to support me. And they're not doing any planning as much as me running things past them. Like, oh, this is what we're hoping to do. Do you know who can do it? And then putting us in touch um, with the right people. So if you've never planned a wedding in a specific destination, how do you find that specialist? Like, is there a vetting process that you go through? Do you fly out there and meet them in person? Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's usually from referrals from, you know, I have a, a lovely little network of other destination wedding planners where we're like, who do you know here? Um, mm -hmm. I call uh, luxury hospitality brands. So I'll call my sales reps from places like Amon, Belmont, um, Four Seasons, like who do you know in this region that would want to support me in this capacity? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really fortunate at this point, I've kind of developed a relationship or a reputation, if you will. So often it's, a wedding planner who may be a little bit more up and coming, who wants to learn the level of work we're doing. And so that it's like a win-win for both of us. Sometimes it's a catering manager somewhere. Sometimes it's, you know, it's been a florist. It just depends. Um, I do do a lot of scouting before I'm fully, you know, throughout the whole planning process. So also on that first trip, I often am meeting with them as well. Um, but usually it comes from a pretty strong referral. I, I'm not Googling. I'm not Instagramming random people. It's It comes from a, a referral from someone who serves the type of client that I serve. So they understand the expectations I'm looking for. That's awesome. So do you prefer, I feel like this is always a good question to ask because a lot of couples make this, I think it's a mistake. Um, sometimes it's not a mistake depending on the situation, but I feel like, by and large, most of the time, the couple should hire the planner before they've settled on their location. Do you prefer that they hire you before they've, they've, especially like the venue? I feel like location is one thing, you know, just the general like Caribbean island or this general region, but the venue itself, I feel like it's always better to hire the wedding planner first. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think um, I like them to know the general region they're getting into. So if they're looking at the Caribbean, um, I think it's as simple as being like, oh, we're looking at St. Bar, Turks and Caicos and Anguilla, for instance. Um, I think it's pretty important to get if you're not emotionally attached to one of those, which a lot of our clients, they come to us and they're like, we're going to Florence and here's why. Um, and in that case, there's there's not a conversation to have. But if if a client is oscillating between those three islands, for instance, there's quite a big difference in what they're going to invest, the vendors that are available, what they can expect, what it just is going to kind of look like for their guests based on like what activities can can take place throughout the wedding weekend. So bringing in a wedding planner when you're kind of in that that phase of narrowing down a region, I think can help you avoid a lot of surprises later. Um 
when I have couples and again, really often that, you know, have ties, um, I have a, I have a client, for instance, who we just did a seven day event in Ravello and she grew up, um, going to Positano every summer with her family and spent a lot of time in Ravello. So she knew it was going to be in Ravello. Um, so when that happens, being a part of the venue selection process is also to their benefit. It's not a necessity. We don't, we don't have, we can still do our job. But what's going to happen is there's going to be more surprises because you may or may not understand, like if you're looking at Ravello, you may or may not understand that a porter has to hand carry all of your stuff through that town or a car can't get through there. Whereas like a wedding planner who knows that information can can just guide you and, you, and your decision is probably still going to be the same. But at least there's not su a surprise later when you get a $15,000 bill from a porter who's carried all your stuff, you know? Um, and then the venues aren't apples to apples. You know, some venues include certain things, some don't. So having a professional look for the things you might not know how to look for, I think only is to your benefit. But I will say a lot of couples call and they're like, we want to find our planner. You know, we want to find our venue first. And I respect that. But I, I think it's uh, having an expert, especially if you're creating a large production for multiple days in a destination, look at what you're looking at before you sign the contract, I think is only to your benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many times where couples, they fall in love with a venue because they got engaged there, or there's something special about that place. And I totally get that. But I think the thing that couples forget about is that destination wedding planners, this is their job. So they know exactly the red flags to look out for when they know something isn't going to be a fit for the overall aesthetics of the event or, you know, something from a logistics standpoint that just isn't, it's just not going to happen. Like, you know what I mean? So I, I do think, you know, it's like you said, understanding the, the location and kind of getting there or you know, those kinds of things are really important for a couple to understand and know and have a preference on. But the venue itself is, is um, it's definitely, I always think like, get your planner first and then they'll know, they'll know like they've yeah. either like in Mexico, you probably, you know, these, these properties really well backwards and forwards. You've, you've seen their strengths, you've seen their weaknesses. So you know exactly how to kind of, you know, work around those things. So when it comes to your approach at creating just kind of a unique and personalized wedding experience for couples, like what, what is that? Can you walk yeah. us through like what you do with your couples to figure out like what their event should be? Yeah. So with destination weddings, we actually really try to create a really special experience that's relevant to the destination. And that's the couple we we are attracting as well. So of course, we're getting to know kind of their preferences as it relates to like um, florals and lighting and just what they envision aesthetically. But we're also talking a lot about things like what's the type of food that they serve in Ravello? What, what type of textiles are made there locally? What type of ceramics can we pull from when we're designing? And most of the clients at this point in my career, that's what they want to do as well. They're not trying to have a wedding in Mexico that they could have had in Chicago, just in a different, different location. So a lot of that has to do with our scouting visit. So we'll go see the venue with our clients. Um, we're sourcing in local markets. We're obviously looking at what's readily available in the event industry, but we're also looking at local artisans. Um, textile designers are really popular. We're even like kind of going to some of the touristy locations to see like what kind of entertainment does like, would you see in the Bahamas if you were to do a, like a touristy celebration? And maybe we incorporate that into the welcome party. And we're definitely yeah. trying the local cuisine to see. And, and that might not be the wedding day. Again, that might be the welcome party. Or maybe it's like an elevated version of what the local cuisine would be. And so really just knowing the region um, helps us make that a, a better experience, I think, for the couple and the guests. And then, of course, we're incorporating their style, which we get to know through creating lookbooks and renderings and touching and feel feeling design elements on our end. Inspiration polls, just like every other wedding planner. But a lot of it is destination driven as well. I love that. Well, the destination is everything, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's the reason we do what we do is there's just so many incredible places around the world. And you want to have that culture and, you know, just the beauty of that destination kind of shine through, I'm assuming. I mean, usually if couples 
are choosing a destination wedding, they're not doing it because of the epic ballroom. They're doing it because of the destination itself. So I love that. Now, when you meet with your couples, are you guys meeting via Zoom or are you meeting in person? Like how, how does that go? It depends on where they're based. We have a a nice little group of clients out of LA, but we also have clients in Texas and New York and Cleveland and Hong Kong. And um, with those clients, we do a lot of phone and Zoom meetings. And then we always do at least two scouting trips through the process. One where we're usually looking at the venue with the couple. Um, The secondary is like food tastings, design presentation, figuring out logistics. So no matter, even if they live in Hong Kong, I'm going to see them at least twice before the wedding um, in person. And then sometimes we do a third one, depending on the complexities of the production and all of that. But yeah, usually zoom or phone for most, but even, yeah, even in LA, my couples don't want to see me in person that often anymore. (laughs) Um, that's probably a sign of the times, but sometimes I'll get a couple that wants to meet every couple weeks or whatever the case may be. And that's fine. People just don't want to get out of their yoga pants and I'm here for it. I understand. Yeah. You should see what are on my feet right now. I have like little like moccasin shoes on. Like <laughs> I'm like, if I have to put on a set of high heels, it's, it better be worth it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> when it comes to guest accommodations, transportation, travel arrangements, all those things for the wedding party and their guests, do you suggest they hire a travel agent or a travel specialist? I mean, is that something that Like you work with someone that you're like, I love this person. They have to be part of every single wedding I do. Or do you kind of leave that up to the couple? How does that work? Yeah, it it really depends on their expectations. More often than not, we're setting up the room blocks ourselves. Um, We are handling things like airport transfers if the couple is hosting that. If it's getting more involved, like the guests want to go do kind of their own excursions or, you know, they need dinner reservations and things like that, we'll often either put them in touch with a travel agent or concierge. Um, they're based locally. Uh, but room blocks and anything that I would consider normal, we typically handle that for our couples. And then we also set up a, an email address um, on for each couple. So Jennifer and Sam at BevHelmstetter.com. And guests can ask us questions about travel. And, and we're usually pretty well ed- educated on 90% of the questions. And if we don't know, we know how to find the information. Got it. Got it. So um, when it comes to budget, this one's a big one. When it comes to budget, what measures do you kind of put in place? Because I know you're dealing with luxury clients. Um, mm-hmm. You are not dealing with, you know, most of the, the, I mean, if you're only planning 10 events a year, you know, you're, these are yeah. these are definitely luxury clients. So even luxury clients have, budgets, right? So how do you help them stay on track with a budget, especially with like the fluctuating market? Because we know what a P&E costs in 2018 is not what it's costing now. And, you know, the staff shortages and just things in general are kind of harder and more expensive. So how do you how do you do that? How do you work with your couples to make sure that they're like, keeping on? budget? Yeah, Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been a learning curve because I've always really just leaned on my experience and historical averages. And before a client (laughs) hires us, we're hashing out the budget down to pretty, not down to the penny, but like a pretty solid range. Like this is where we think we're going to start. Here are the thing, here are the factors that could make you go above, above this, but you're, you're always in control and you'll decide what you want to do. 2022 was you know, especially the tail end was pretty eye opening because inflation was crazy. And it's, it's interesting. And in, in, uh, I don't want it to come across as judgment. It's just like a something I play with in my head, because, you know, inflation will be 8% or what have you, but I'm seeing people raise their prices 20, 30, 40%. And so it's like, it's really hard to predict that. And so moving forward for any of our clients in 2023 and 2024, I'm being really transparent. I'm actually the budgets that I create off of historical averages, they're, they're well padded. And I even mention you, know, I talk about inflation and, you know, we talk about it in terms of everyday things and how that impact, you know, how you're going to see the same in the wedding industry. But I still, I, I would be lying. I still don't have a full handle on like what's normal right now for our industry because the prices are so different every time I call my, and these are vendors I've been using for a decade that I'm like, wait, last year you did this for like this price and it's like triple the cost right now. I'm so confused, you know? Right. And it is tough. I mean, it is changing all the time. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you're saying like, I don't necessarily know like it because it is, it's like one minute, 
you go and you you see a price of something and then two months later, like it just seems like everything I come across just as a person, not even in the wedding industry, but just as a person, everything is costing more. I mean, yeah. you know, you go to a restaurant and like the martini used to be $18. Now it's 22. And mm-hmm. you're like, really? Like that's a huge percentage wise. That's a huge jump, you know? Yeah. And so every, I mean, even my babysitters, oh my gosh, I'm like, you guys are, I'm going to go bankrupt. Like if I ever yeah. want to go on a date with my husband and like, forget it. You're, oh yeah. My payroll mean, is like, in my, yeah, at this point it's, it's crazy, which is, is why, right. It's like you, you're, you're paying your people more. So you have to make up for that somewhere. Right. So it has a lot to do with all the things you're talking about for sure. Yeah. Cause that's impacting everyone. Your babysitter is paying more for groceries too, you know? And so, right. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. I also will say I, I used to be super confident that when someone sent me like, Oh, Beth, I, you know, I like these, this stationery. And what do you think about this? And I used to be like, Oh, it's probably X amount. This, you know, that's where I think, but I'm not as confident now. I'm like, let me actually like get the quote before we dive too deep into this. So we're really, we're looking at today's numbers and not just going off of my experience, which you know, it makes my job a little clunkier. Uh, but it's, it's, it's better than going back and saying, just kidding, that's actually double the price as I thought it was going to be, you know? Well, and then it also, I would think kind of goes along the lines of like, if someone if they love that stationery, and today, the price is this yesterday, it was that, like, get it now, because it's probably yeah. going to go up, right? So are you yeah. kind of telling your couples like, listen, like, let's not wait on this, because like things are in such fluctuation. Like we want to get this contract signed or we want to get this product ordered or whatever, because this is what the price is today. And it's only going to go up. It's not going down. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting because it's a natural tendency of a client to want to be like, Oh, do you think we can do better? Do you think we're going to get a, we could get a better price. And it's more of like, we can ask, but probably it's probably not. It's probably in your best interest to take this because it is the demand has changed, the pricing have, have changed, and people are a lot less willing to negotiate. I think that the, that will start to even out, I think. Like, I think we're all kind of seeing um, some differences in the workflow and, and all of that coming through. So I think that'll start to even out. But yeah, right now, it's like, it's just not the time to negotiate. And if that's, if that's where you're at, it's like, maybe wait out until the recession hits and people are a little hungrier or something. I'm not sure. And I don't even know if a recession is going to hit. Um, but you know, nope. that's the, nobody that's does. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that's they've, the talk of it now. They've been threatening that for a minute, and it's like you just nobody has a crystal ball. I mean, yep. you can listen yep. to these financial experts, and you just never nobody knows. And the thing is, the wedding industry is dependent on so many different things. I think that's what a lot of couples don't understand. I hear the comment, "Oh, the minute I said wedding, the price just went up." But it's like, when you think about a dinner party, you don't have the trappings of a lot of what goes into a wedding, right? You're not hiring photographers necessarily. You're not, you know, there's a lot of things that logistically are more complicated with the wedding. So it's not necessarily that you just said wedding. So everyone's like got their hand out trying to charge more. There is more that goes into it. And there's so many other industries that impact the wedding industry, like the floral industry. I mean, you think about what happened during the pandemic you know, a lot of floral growers just had to shut down completely. And so it created like a supply chain issue and a supply issue for, you know, and that's going to drive the cost up. So there's just so many little tiny things that keep adding to what couples are experiencing, what you're experiencing as, you know, this is your business. This is what you do. Like you're the expert. And so you know, it's, it's kind of crazy right now, but it, it, I think you're right. I think eventually it will even out and, you know, hopefully we'll see things just kind of calm down a little bit. Now yeah. this wasn't on your, I always send a list of questions to our experts so that they, you know, they can be armed and I didn't send this one to you. So I apologize, but are you finding that the demand from the couples is the same as it was in 2022? Like, you know, we had the post pandemic, not post, but pandemic end ish, I guess, if you will. Um, People were kind of like, okay, I waited to get married. Now I'm getting married, or I postponed three times. And now it's time. And so we had this influx of all of these weddings. 
are you seeing that still like this demand where like photographers forget it, they're booked out, Mm -hmm. hair and makeup booked out? Are you still seeing like the level of like freneticness, if you will, from last year to this year? Is it calmed down just a little bit? I'm not seeing that on my end. I'm not seeing that with my own um, workload. I'm not seeing that with the vendors that I'm normally tapping. Um, I am seeing, I do think there's like, um, I don't know if fear is the right word, but there's an urgency from couples. So they're booking a lot further out. So that might not be, um, that might be the reason for instance. So, you know, pre pandemic, I was booking maybe nine months to a year out. And now I'm easily booking a year to a year and a half sometimes even more. And so people I think are getting um, an earlier start on things. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe that's why I'm not running into the same issues as I I was before. But um, yeah, 2022, forget it. It was, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly spoiled. And you're going to know when I say this, but very few people say no to me. And the amount of no's that I got from like my (laughs) rental companies and like, they're like, we just can't do it. And I'm like, what are you you talking about? We can't do like, I, you know, I'm just so used to it always being yes. And it's just not what was happening last year, but I am seeing that settle down. Well, and I think there becomes like a scarcity mindset, right? Like people Mm -hmm. are going, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm reading it. You know, I'm, I read a lot of wedding outlets myself, you know, just being in the industry, I want to see what other media outlets are reporting on. Cause I want to see if it's the same or similar to what we're seeing on the destination wedding end of things. And, you know, I do think like there was a lot of, um, like news articles saying, Hey, if you haven't booked your, your hair and makeup person, like you better do it six months out, not three or two months Mm -hmm. out, but like it was before. Um, Mm -hmm. if you want your, you know, your, your live entertainment, we're talking, you know, eight months out. And so I do think that there's like the scarcity mindset that kind of creates an an extra pressure that maybe wasn't there pre pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that from their end, it's also, you know, what a lot of my couples are concerned about is they're competing for lack of a better word with dates with like all their girlfriends who are getting married or or whatever the case may be. So they're like, I got to get my save the date out. Three of my friends are getting married next year too. Like I need to get a lot of this locked in. So I still think couples are feeling it in their personal lives as well. Um, but I do think it's settling down, but I think it, it has a lot more to do with, um, planning further out than it actually things are settling down. I think anyone who's booking a wedding six months out, four months out, you're, you're, you're going to take what you can get sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So when a couple hires you, did they typically hire you for just the wedding or are they doing, cause destination weddings, there's way more involved with the guests. Cause typically there's, you know, a welcome reception. There's the rehearsal dinner, which is pretty standard for any wedding, but then there's also excursions, there's a farewell brunch. So there's a lot of events around that. So when a couple hires you, do you just automatically plan all of those things as your scope of work? Or is it something that it's like, we do these two things and then anything else, you know, we'll work with you on, or we can, you know, help outsource that. How does that work? Yeah. Um, 90% of the time we're doing everything that they want to do. So, um, the wedding I just did in Ravello, we did, um, we did a welcome party, a rehearsal dinner, a bride's lunch, a groom's lunch, um, an excursion, the wedding day, a pool party the day after. And we took care of all of it from beginning to end. I say 90% because every now and then I'll get a couple that you're, that will be like, you know what? The groom's mom wants to take care of the rehearsal dinner, Um, and she just wants to do it herself and she doesn't need the support of a wedding planner. So when we're not involved in something, it's usually because there's another host or another third party that either doesn't want a wedding planner, doesn't understand what we really bring to the table, that sort of thing. Um, but most of the time we're in it with them from beginning to end. I love that. Well, and it's funny because I do think, I feel like family members sometimes don't necessarily understand the importance of a wedding planner. Like I watched it unfold multiple times in my own family where it's like, oh no, no, we got this. We got this. And then the rehearsal dinner is like a flaming disaster. You know what I mean? Like people aren't getting fed until 11 o'clock at night and like kids are melting down and it's a whole thing. And it's like, oh no, no, those, like those things can actually go a lot smoother if the wedding planner is involved in it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of times too, you guys are, are saving money, maybe not necessarily in the sense of like, you're getting discounts, but you're helping people avoid costly mistakes, you know? Yeah. 
And I think yeah. couples oftentimes don't realize the importance, especially for a destination wedding, how important a planner is um, because of those costly mistakes. I mean, travel right now is through the roof and, you know, it can be, it can be a very expensive thing for, you know, guests if things aren't done correctly. And, and so you definitely mm-hmm. want to, and especially like room blocks, those are really important. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, if, you know, travelocity is not necessarily like the best place to get your room. If you're, <laughs> yeah, if you're one of the guests, like go, go through you guys, you know what you're doing. So what would you say is the number one major mistake that couples make when planning their destination weddings? Hmm. I, not our clients, cause we really focus on this, but not going into it, realizing that your guests have higher expectations. I think that um, when guests are investing in travel, when they're investing vacation days, if that's their situation, and also investing money, um, and they get there and they don't feel like they were thought of, um, even, you know, I will have very fancy clients who this is, you know, this is not a thing for, but they'll even say to me, oh, I went to this destination wedding and the hotel room the couple was recommending was $3,000 a night. And we just think it's rude, you know, like we, we want to make sure that like, even if our couples could afford it, that they, you know, they have another option, um, that you're doing things that let them know it's your, it's meaningful for them to be there for you. I think that, um, you know, it's really easy to kind of get wrapped up in like, of course it's going to be great. We're all going to go to Italy, but, and not put yourself in the guest shoes and, and, and everything they're sacrificing to be there for you. And, and they want to be there, but I think there's a real bad taste that gets left in guests' mouth when their needs are not considered. Um, and so this is, this is something we put a lot of, uh, we put a lot of priority on in our process. So it's not necessarily an issue with our clients, but I, I see it happen a lot and I hear it as the aftermath of my clients who've been guests at other destination weddings as well. Yeah. I absolutely love that because if you think about it, you know, a lot of times the destination wedding isn't necessarily more expensive for the couple, but it is yeah. more expensive for the guests often. And, and it depends. Like if they had to travel anyway to your wedding, even if it was in a hometown, that was part of the yeah. reason I had a destination wedding is everyone was going to have to travel anyway. So do you yeah. want to travel to Scottsdale, Arizona and August or do you want to go to San Diego? Like, you know what I mean? So that was kind of the idea behind it. But when they're having, when they are treating it maybe like their own vacation and so they're, and they're taking time off work and you know, all these things, it, you should make sure that they're welcomed, you know, having a welcome amenity in their room, you know, but I feel like that's like, you have to do that. Plus it's fun. It's a fun thing. People get there. They feel appreciated they feel like their presence is their present to use a super cliche yeah. you know yeah. but it's true I think that they do have a higher expectation of what that event is going to be like and what they're going to experience and mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of things that you can do that are not expensive that are not you know over the top that make people feel you know, that they have been thought of and room rates are a big one. I mean, I see, and this is where like all inclusives can be a little tricky because, you know, there are really high end gourmet all, all inclusives that are out there that are, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars per night. And you can still do your wedding at those places oftentimes and do like a per diem for the guests so they can stay off property but if you're just saying like you have to stay here and it's going to be, you know, $2500 a night, like that's that could be someone's entire budget. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because you've got the means doesn't mean other people do and it can make people feel very like excluded if you're not careful. So I love that bit of advice. So, yeah. okay, this is a fun part for you. Give us three words that would describe what it's like to work with you. Hmm. I think it's easy. Uh, I I mean, this is not three words, but I, I believe kind of the definition of luxury is taking the worry out of a process. And that's what we try to do for our couples. Um, I think it's connected. We, we spend a lot of time connecting with our clients, um, ensuring we're thinking about moments of connection with their guests as well. And I like to think it's fun. I, I mean, I think it's probably pretty fun. Uh, just 
by the mere fact that you're talking about your wedding, but we, we really do try to pull a lot of the stress out so you can really just focus on the fun stuff for sure. That's awesome. Okay. So sidebar, you also have a company called The Good Beginning. I do. And I have a feeling this is kind of a passion project for you. Yes. And I would love if you would tell us everything. Yeah. The Good Beginning, um, it, it's actually going through uh, the process of getting 501c3 status, but right now it is more of a social enterprise, if you will, though I certainly do not make a profit on it. But it is a wedding registry um, where couples can choose up to three charities to donate to in lieu of, or in addition to wedding gifts. At this point, most of our couples are registering at places like Target and Bloomingdale's, as well as picking a charity or two that they love. Um, and you share it on your website, just like you would any registry. Couples, um, your guests can go and make a donation on your behalf. And then at the end, it makes like a nice gift towards something that's really meaningful to you as a couple. Um, yeah, and I am proud of it. I think it's a, it's, we've, we've made really, I'm trying to think we've been uh, open since 2017 and we've raised about $1.2 million. Uh, wow. we've helped our couples facilitate about one, $1.2 million. And, and, um, with some of the changes we're making in the infrastructure, I think it's going to be even more successful. So I'm really excited. That's awesome. You should be really proud. That's a huge Thanks. accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining the show. I just appreciate so much of your just helpful tips and your insight. And, you know, I love your biggest mistake, uh, commentary because it's it's so so true and I just I love what you're doing you have beautiful events Beth was one of the I want to say like one of the earliest um planners that we ever featured in Destination Ideal like it's been over a decade I think since we like the very first time we featured you so it's uh I think one of the first weddings you featured was a wedding I did when I was working at the resort even. So you yes. I, you and I have been in cahoots since before I even had my own business. So I've been very grateful for that over the years. Yes. I'm so grateful for you. I'm hashtag fangirl and have been for many, many years. So <laughs> anyway, if you would like more information on Beth and her beautiful company and um, the good beginning, go to bethhelmstutter.com. If you are looking to follow her on social, social media, she's at Beth Helmstutter. And if you would like to like, follow, comment, send us so show suggestions, whatever works for you, you can reach out to info at destinationido.com and tell us how we're doing. And you can also follow us at Destination I Do. And our website is destinationido.com. By the way, it literally relaunched yesterday. So it's pretty Thank epic you. now. We're like really excited because it's, I mean launching a new website is oh my it's like a living breathing thing and it's never easy to do yeah. um, but it's here and it's live and we're really excited about it um so thank you so much beth for joining our show and we will see you all next time